Welcome back, fellow mitochondriacs, for another episode of Cancer is a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. In this video, I'm going to continue to share on the most recent paper published by Seafried and his group up at Boston College. I'm going to cover a couple of extremely key points that leads to a lot of fear and confusion, especially when looking at implementing a calorie-restricted ketogenic diet for cancer. There are a whole host of papers that sort of muddy the water when it comes to cancer's ability to use oxidative phosphorylation and fat and subsequently ketone bodies for fuel. And I'm going to use this C-free paper to help unravel some of these hypotheses and to hopefully provide a level of clarity, certainty, and peace and calmness when looking at the metabolism of cancer. So without further ado, let's get into it. So using the same outline as the prior video, when looking at this C-free paper, we're going to be looking at questionable assumptions number four and five. So questionable assumption number four is the number, structure, and function of mitochondria are similar in tumor tissue and in non-cancerous tissues. And it says here, Warburg based his hypothesis that ATP production through respiration was insufficient in cancer cells, primarily on the quantitative comparison of oxygen consumption and lactate production between normal and cancerous tissues. Warburg's evidence for oxphos impairment in cancer was largely discounted on Winehouse's 1976 statement. Despite massive efforts during the half century following the Warburg proposal to find some alteration in function or structure of mitochondria that might conceivably give some measure of support to the Warburg hypothesis, no substantial evidence has been found that would indicate a respiratory defect either in the machinery of the electron transport or in the coupling of respiration with ATP formation or in the unique presence or absence of mitochondrial enzymes or cofactors involved in electron transport. Based on the foundational principles of evolutionary biology and in the recognition that mitochondrial structure determines function, the information in figures two and table one presents substantial evidence for abnormalities in the number structure and function of mitochondria in all major cancers. Moreover, no tumor has yet been described with a normal content or composition of cardiolipin, the inner mitochondrial membrane enriched phospholipid essential for the efficiency of oxphos function. Reductions have also been reported in neoplasms for mitochondrial coenzyme Q, which like cardiolipin is also essential for oxphos efficiency. Hence, these findings considered collectively address the premature criticisms of Winehouse in providing a significant measure of support for Warburg's central hypothesis. So the graphic that he was referring to was electron micrographs effectively of dysfunctional and structurally damaged mitochondria. I want to in particular highlight these two images here where you see a mitochondria with no cristae whatsoever, the infoldings of the inner mitochondrial membrane. And in this one, you see only a few folds or cristae. And then here's another mitochondria with no mitochondrial cristae whatsoever. Then the table he's referring to is this table here, and it shows in systematic format, all major cancers, including leukemias, lymphomas, including AML, CLL, ALL, all major cancers, with mitochondrial abnormalities that have been observed and every single paper that has shown it. I added some things to make this argument even stronger. So a somewhat recent discovery has been of this mitochondrial supercomplex or the respirosome. And we now know that the respirosome is formed under certain conditions and that respirosome gives competitive fitness that does not exist when it is not formed. This paper was published in January of 2021. It says mitochondrial respiratory supercomplexes in mammalian cells, structural versus functional role. And it says, according to this model, 
individual electron transport chain complexes are assembled into macromolecular structures known as respiratory supercomplexes. A large number of studies over the last 20 years propose the potential role of supercomplexes to facilitate substrate channeling, maintain the integrity of the individual ETC complexes, reduce electron leakage and production of reactive oxygen species, and prevent excessive and random aggregation of proteins in the inner mitochondrial membrane. This paper was published in November of 2022, Mitochondrial Respiratory Chain Supercomplexes from Structure to Function. The supercomplexes not only have respiratory functions, but also improve the efficiency of electron transfer and reduce the production of reactive oxygen species, ROS. Impaired assembly of supercomplexes is closely related to various diseases, especially neurodegenerative diseases. And you see here that when it's assembled, it's going to make minimal amounts of ROS and it's going to be more efficient at making ATP. And when they're disassembled, they're going to have much more ROS and less ATP. And what we also know is that the mitochondrial cristae, those infoldings of the inner mitochondrial membrane are what determine whether or not the respiratory chain supercomplexes assemble or don't assemble and also lead to respiratory efficiency. Respiratory chain supercomplexes function into functional quaternary structures called supercomplexes within the folds of the inner mitochondrial membrane or cristae. Here we investigate the relationship between respiratory function and mitochondrial ultrastructure and provide evidence that crista shape determines the assembly and stability of, of the respiratory supercomplexes and hence mitochondrial respiratory efficiency. And in this next graphic, it shows that when there's cristae that are functionally there and present, that's when the mitochondrial supercomplexes can form. And when the cristae are perturbed, that's when the mitochondrial proteins essentially deaggregate and lead to the problems that we would see when there are no supercomplex formation. The respiratory proteins themselves make up important parts of the cristae that allow the supercomplexes to be formed. But one of the major reasons why these are formed is because of cardiolipin. Associated with cristae are numerous proteins that function in distinctive ways to establish and or maintain their lipid repertoire and structural integrity. By combining unique lipid components with a set of protein modulators, crista membranes adopt and maintain their characteristic morphological and functional properties. Once established, crista ultrastructure have a direct impact on oxidative phosphorylation, apoptosis, fission fusion, as well as diseases of compromised energy metabolism. And what we'll see in the next graphic is basically that when cardiolipin is added to the mix, the mitochondrial cristae will have a more appropriate folding pattern and the supercomplexes can form. And when there are oxidative damage to cardiolipin or cardiolipin peroxidation, that's when the cristae become less folded on themselves and the mitochondrial supercomplex essentially falls apart. So when Dr. Seafried in this particular paper is saying that no tumor has been described with normal content of cardiolipin, that already is showing that the mitochondrial supercomplexes and the architecture of the mitochondrial cristae are dysfunctional, which is going to lead to the inability for the respiratory supercomplexes to form, and it's going to lead to low output of ATP and excessive output of reactive oxygen species. Furthermore, as described by Dr. Douglas Wallace, who is a major mitochondrial researcher, we see that certain environmental factors lead to oxphos dysfunction. Oxphos dysfunction leads to somatic DNA mutations within the mitochondria, which leads to a progressive energetic decline, which leads to, in terms of cancer, the initiation, promotion, and metastatic potential of cancer. This is another graphic showing the same thing, but it's, I've particularly highlighted how this process leads to the Warburg metabolism, as we've seen. I'll also say that this graphic here, where you have wild-type mitochondria or low mitochondrial heteroplasmy and increasing amounts of heteroplasmy until you hit a biologic threshold, also seen in a graphic that looks like this, is very similar to what Dr. Seafried has put out in multiple papers where you have normal mitochondrial structure and function. You see most of the energy production going through oxidative phosphorylation. Ultimately, you see a gradual decline in oxphos or bioenergetic decline as described by Dr. Wallace, and you see a threshold event. You also see here where the mitochondria are more like what he calls ghost mitochondria without definitive cristae, which signals to us that there are no functional mitochondrial supercomplexes and that ATP production is going to be minimal. So when we look at non-tumoral oxidative cells, 
these cells are metabolically flexible. They can use glucose, they can use proteins that act as ketogenic and glucogenic amino acids. We have beta oxidation and ketone metabolism, but ultimately you're gonna need a functioning mitochondria for that to make robust amounts of energy. If we were to look at particularly this graphic here, if we were to look at maybe being in the middle here, this corresponds with this oxygen consuming phenotype with partial mitochondrial defects where you have ineffective ATP being made through oxphos. So therefore what's happening is, is that glucose and glutamine are starting to set up shop as being the more dominant sources of energy as a way to maintain the cell to stay alive. And ultimately when we get to the high heteroplasmid defective oxphos being symptomatic of some disease state, and that's when the Warburg metabolism is fully taking over as the energy production for the cell. This is also known as cytosolic and ultimately mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation through the use of glucose and glutamine in a fermentation role where you have severe mitochondrial defects. You have vacuolated ghost mitochondria that are not making any ATP whatsoever or not enough to sustain the cell. And what is sustaining the cell is this substrate level phosphorylation. The next questionable assumption, fatty acid oxidation can provide sufficient ATP through oxphos in cancer cells. So in the same line, if we have damaged dysfunctional mitochondria, the question is, can fatty acids be utilized by cancer cells to make sufficient ATP? As it says here, despite substantial evidence showing that fatty acids are not a major fuel for driving the growth of malignant tumor cells, the presence of cytoplasmic lipid droplets in various cancers has been considered evidence to many investigators that cancer cells can use fatty acid beta oxidation for energy production and growth. It is well known that hypoxia induced inhibition of oxphos efficiency elicits the rapid formation of cytoplasmic lipid droplets in normal cells by blocking fatty acid beta oxidation. Cytoplasmic lipid droplets also accumulate following induced abnormalities in mitochondrial structure and function. If abnormalities in mitochondrial structure and function have been documented in all major cancers, then cytoplasmic lipid droplets should also be observed in these same cancers. Indeed, cytoplasmic lipid droplets are seen in the most common cancer types where abnormalities in mitochondrial number, structure, and function are also seen. The structural and functional abnormalities seen in cancer mitochondria would compromise oxphos efficiency and thus contribute to the accumulation of triglyceride lipid droplets seen in cancer cytoplasm. Hence, the presence of cytoplasmic lipid droplets and the aerobic fermentation commonly seen in most malignant cancers can serve together as a biomarker for oxphos inefficiency. Then they show in a table effectively all of the different cancers that have been found to have accumulation of these lipid droplets, bladder cancer, breast cancer, colorectal gastric cancer, gliomas, kidney, renal cell carcinoma, leukemias, lymphomas, including AML, CLL, and ALL liver, hepatic cancers, lung, melanoma, neuroblastoma, osteosarcoma, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, retinoblastoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, salivary gland and oral cancers, uterine and endometrial cancers. And then they have pictures of what these lipid droplets actually look like. So I think this provides unbelievable evidence to the contrary that cancer does not use fat for fuel. It later says lipids can also act as uncoupling agents that produce oxidative stress in cells with inefficient or compromised oxphos. Lipid-induced uncoupling, however, might increase tumor growth by enhancing the use of fermentable fuels, glucose and glutamine, making it appear as if fatty acid beta oxidation can provide sufficient ATP production through oxphos for cancer cell growth. While some ATP production could be derived from fatty acid beta oxidation in cancer cell mitochondria, it would be insufficient by itself to support the bioenergetic requirements in cancer cells. It later says, hence the data suggests that cancer cells store lipids in the cytoplasmic droplets, not as a fuel source for beta oxidation or for ATP production and growth, but rather as a protective mechanism to prevent oxidative stress and cell death and also maintain cytoplasmic transaminations. I'm going back to this slide because it's so critical for us to understand. So, under normal conditions, 
when we have cells that have functioning oxidative phosphorylation, the vast majority of energy is going to be used through this system. It doesn't matter if these are fatty acids, ketone bodies, glucose, or a variety of amino acids that can either be glucogenic or ketogenic amino acids. They are all gonna go ultimately through the TCA cycle and then ultimately to the electron transport chain and they're gonna require oxygen to do it through the oxidative phosphorylation to make energy. This is also known as aerobic metabolism or aerobic conditions. Over time, as heteroplasmy of mitochondria build up, the bioenergetics of the cell start to depend more and more on glucose and glutamine and less and less on the normal oxidative metabolism seen in normal cells. This is further highlighted by this slide here where you see a wild type mitochondria that is using the normal oxidative metabolism and the mutant mitochondria that make up the high heteroplasmid cells as seen here by these red dots. When they take over, you see glucose and I'm gonna move myself out of the way, you see glutamine being utilized, similar to that as ascribed by multiple research groups, including Seafried and his group. Basically what many people in the research community are arguing for is that it doesn't really matter if you're in a ketogenic diet or a high glucose diet or a high protein diet, because ultimately these cancer cells are metabolically flexible to that of their non-cancerous cousins. And that is fundamentally not true not only because the mitochondria are structurally dysfunctional and have been described in nearly every type of cancer ever seen. And you can see these authors are other than Seafree. These are many, many other authors have described mitochondrial abnormalities in common cancers. We also know that these lipid droplets are accumulating as evidence to that the mitochondria are not able to burn these lipids as fuel. Ultimately, what I wanted to do this video was be provocative and somewhat attract the folks who believe in some way, shape, or form that they or their loved ones have a type of cancer that can survive and thrive on fatty acids or ketone bodies for fuel. There is very little or no evidence that that is actually a thing. In the absence of the fermentable fuels, glucose and glutamine, the goal of this video was to further use this more recent Seafree paper to, and its dismantling of conventional oncology's belief to give some peace and solace to those who are up at night worried if they're doing the right thing by being on a ketogenic diet and if they're effectively shooting themselves in the foot by being on a ketogenic diet. I hope that this is one video that can help give that peace. The next video we do, I'm gonna take a detour from Seafried's paper, and I'm going to look at whether or not cancer cells can use ketones or other amino acids other than glutamine to burn for fuel. If you like videos like this, please like, share, and subscribe. Until next time.